Good morning, everyone. See, now we're really mixing. It's my mix, remix version. I love a good 8-bit mix in the morning. All right. We don't need no 24. We don't need no... Yeah. I've been 16-bit for a long time. Welcome. Thanks for coming down here at 11.15 this morning here, AES 2019. I am your grand moderator, ambassador of audio, annoyer of all, Chris Lord Algy here. And uh, my topic today with all of you is how we make music. And most of my discussion is going to be about how we make music without the aid of cheating and how we made it without all the computers and even with the computers, how we make music, okay? And I brought some special guests with me here today, um, some friends some that I've known for many years and some of the top talents in the world, starting closest to me, Danny Karchmeyer, guitar player extraordinaire, producer extraordinaire. He has his band, Immediate Family, and they are actually doing shows because the popularity is beyond anything we could imagine. And he has four of the heaviest hitting musicians on one stage. And they'll be playing at the Iridium three nights in a row coming up. Danny's been making records and still making records to this day, every day, all the time. And does it in his own style, okay? And that style has been successful and sold millions and millions of records, okay? And as a songwriter, his publishing is hard to touch. Next to him is the infamous Dave Way, engineer extraordinaire, producer, studio owner, has worked with many bands A to Z, part of our family of engineers and producers. Glad to have you on board, Dave. Thank you. Next to Dave Way, it's hard to even imagine that the world of music would be without Eddie Kramer. Eddie Kramer has worked with artists that you might know, Jimi Hendrix, Led Zeppelin. He makes a whole lot of love, which sits on my turntable as an inspiration at my studio, okay? And, but that's not all he's done. He's a, an amazing photographer. He helped in the design of one of the greatest recording studios in the world. He creates all kinds of musical devices from foot pedals to audio equipment and is current in all the technology and top of his game. Eddie Kramer, thank you for coming. Yeah. Last but not least, there, there would be no CLA without TLA, my brother Tom Lord Algy, who won his first Grammy before me in 1988 for Steve Winwood's Back in the High Life album, and a second Grammy for Roll With It, okay? And those Grammys continue to flow in for him. He's worked with every artist from A to Z, continues to, and worked with artists I haven't worked with, so I'm pretty fucking jealous. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's the family of audio, not too many families where we're both kind of doing the same thing. So Tom has done, recorded some amazing records, as you can tell and heard, and the one that defined a whole era was the Back in the High Life record and what was done with Roll With It. And, you know, we make music with our own rules, okay? And we're creators. We're not documenters. So here's our panel of four, okay? And plus me up here front. I'm Chris Lord Algy, the, the ambassador of annoyance here today, this morning, at AS 2019. So glad to have some of you aboard. I know the other seats are empty because the hangover is too hard to get down the stairs. I saw many of them at the parties last night. So our topic is pretty simple, okay? How we make music. I'm not going to talk about loudness. I'm not going to talk about digital. I'm not going to talk about Pro Tools. None of that bullshit. I'm going to talk about what our job is and what we've done, okay? As engineers, as producers, as songwriters, as people who make music, okay, it starts out with the player. It starts out with getting a sound. It starts out with assembling artists in a room, okay? We don't look at the rig and figure out the shortcuts. We figure out the song and the players, and they work out those parts, okay? We don't cut and paste, okay? We don't auto-tune. We don't think of shortcuts first. We just make magic happen, okay? That's what we know, okay? All these tools that have been brought forward to us to make our jobs e easier, I feel has turned the musician into a lazy-ass bastard, okay? Okay? Yeah. 
So it's turned bands into non-musical bands, all right? So we've worked with both. We see both sides of the coins. Most of us will not involve ourselves producing artists that don't actually play the part or play the music. So every one of us here is a creator of how we make music, which is how we do it. I can say old school, but I think it's the only school, okay? It, you know, you can always cheat with the best musician, and then it's going to only be, go beyond amazing. So I'm going to start right here, the closest to me, with Danny Korchmeyer, who's done much tracking, much recording. And just I'm going to have a quick window into a tracking session and a writing session that Danny does with real musicians. So, Danny, just give me a typical setup when you guys would go in, say with one of these unknown artists, Don Henley, um, and you'd go in and track and come up with a song. You know, what was a typical setup and a typical day for you when you were cutting some of these songs? Well, I'll give you the uh, the process, Chris, which is uh, with Henley. When I was working with Henley, first thing we'd do is sit around and talk about what he wanted to say. Very important. Uh, the first thing we'd do is we'd throw ideas back and forth. Don had a lot of ideas, of course. And we talked about what he wanted to say and how he wanted to say it. Then usually I would go back to my little home demo studio and so I'd come up with some music that I thought was appropriate that worked with what we, what we had been talking about. One, a good example was uh, his song Dirty Laundry. He had this idea he wanted to write a song dirty about the media, which at the time was taking him to task in Los Angeles. So I went home, screwed around, and finally I, I ended up for some reason putting a, uh, a Farfisa organ through an echoplex and started banging away and came up with the sound that you hear on that song, the opening track, the opening sound of it. And uh, started playing it over and over and over and over and over again, over and again and over again. And um, finally, uh, I said, this is going to be good for Dirty Launch because it's just a repetitive groove. And uh, uh, my, my goal was to uh, make a record that was an ass shaker, but also had something to say. And, and I qualified for both. In other words, you would dance to it, but if you listened, there would be a great message and uh, a whole lot to take home with you. So the process was, we started, like I said, on the Farfisa organ. We went in there figured out how to play it in, in Don's key, and off we went and started, started uh, doing the process. And we got Jeff Beccaro on drums. Everybody started banging away at the same time, and away we went. So I would have thought that Don was playing drums, but it was Jeff. That's right. On that one, it was Jeff, yeah. Now, was it a comp, like a hybrid with some drum machine and yeah, playing right. against it? We had one of the first Lynn drum machines, uh, uh, Henley and I, and... Uh, so, yeah, when I was doing the demo, of course, I was using a drum machine. to get. A and it was, that was like the click track and then the, those yeah. moments where, like the quiet bits, and then the drums kick in, the whole song takes off from That's there. That's exactly right, yes. And then it's all drums from that point forward. That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. Now, what about the crazy lead guitar solo that has, like, the delay on it, and it's going through the amp, and it just it sounds like a fucking runaway train. Is well, we you? needed something special in there, and um, Henley said, well, let's get Walsh. So we got Joe come in. Joe Walsh came in. And he played, also ran into an echoplex, the same kind of beat that I had going on the uh, Farfisa. And away he went. So that was Joe then doing that. Joe did that, the, the delay solo. And then there's a solo at the end that Steve Lukather did, a beautiful one of his hits. Amazing oh, so it, was, it wasn't, uh, so it was two guys on there. Two different wow. guys, yeah. Uh, Jeez. And I'm playing rhythm guitar and Farfisa, of course. Uh -huh. Well, that Farfisa hook is like, to this day, is such a strong part of that song. Right. So it was just created from a riff. That's right. Right, and there, and with the vocal with Don, there was no flying. It was he kept punching it until he was happy with it. Right, and also we was comping. We, he, he was the king of the comps, and we would spend a long time. He would record five or six vocals, comp them, and then sometimes go in and fix the comp. So he was very meticulous about his, of course, about his vocals. You know. But during this record, it, there wasn't like, okay, well, we'll just tune that line, or we'll just fix that line. There no, was we're none of that stuff. Was there was none of that stuff. There was no MIDI when we did that. I mean, this it was MIDI. not our style. Did you hear that? Right. Uh -huh. And, you know, with Don, he, like I said, he, that's the way he'd been used to doing it, and he was great at it. And uh, he would sit with his lyric sheet, and, uh, and we would comp. Old school. Old school. I mean, the way I always did vocals when I produced, I hated to even have to comp. I just wanted to have one track, <laughs> sing the vocal, keep punching it in until we chipped away at the lines you didn't like, and then I didn't have to focus on listening to five other vocals. Right, that's a so good way, too. So similar way to do that. Right, right. That's, that's a good story about dirty laundry here from, um, from Danny. Let's move. Danny, thank you. That's a good story. Let's move on to my brother, Tom. I'm just going to go to the other end of the table. Hello. So... 
Tommy, tell me about when you guys were working with um, Russ Tyleman on back in the high life, and you were doing drums. What was different about the way you were cutting drums than most people? Um, it was actually the first time I recorded drums in a studio. <laughs> 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 Literally, I, I'd never recorded a live drum set <clears throat> in a recording studio before. But my background, I started my career with my brother Chris, who was a drummer, um, mixing his band live. Um, actually, it goes back a little further. I actually started doing, doing lights and with another band. And uh, the sound man got sick one night. And, and uh, they asked me to do sound, and uh, I never looked back from there. I guess I did a good job. But I'm back in the high life uh, on that record. Chris had taught me, it's just, it doesn't matter what they ask you to do. The answer is always, yeah, oh, yeah, I've done that. Um, so, yeah, when Tidalman asked me, you know, have you ever recorded live drums before? And I'm like, oh, of course, you know, no problem. I've never done it before. So what was different um, was the fact that I had no idea what I was doing, to be quite honest, and I took... The, the the teachings, or I stole from what I saw from my brother Chris, what he was doing. So, in other words, particularly in the microphone, the the microphones that I was using back then, which would have been a you know um, an RE twenty on the bass drum, obviously fifty seven on the on the snare, that we were using four twenty ones on the tom toms, four fourteens on the overheads, and then uh, sixty seven or eighty sevens on the room. Um, and so I took what I saw Chris do using, and those were the microphones that I used, placed them where I would have placed them if I was doing a live gig. And uh, again, you know, for me, what I learned in recording back in, back in the High Life to Drums was the room is your friend. Yeah. Um, but, and so but, I really, really, you know, that hid all the sins of maybe the mistakes that I might have done in some of the miking. And again, as I went through that project, I think I got a little bit better, you know, as we, we cut after, like, the first couple of tracks. Well, what about the ones where the drums were kind of done in, se- in separate parts and pieces, where it's, like, kick, separate, snare? Wasn't there a couple of songs that it was, like, all piecemeal? Well, yeah, so Higher Love, the right. song Higher Love. So the song Back in the High Life was a performance right, right. on the drum set again. So that's that whole album started life as... Um, as a drum machine, uh, Jimmy Braylauer programmed the, dr- the drums on that and programmed the, the machine percussion. And then all the drum parts, all the live drum parts with all the drummers that we used were overdubbed. Um, back in the High Life was actually, the song Back in the High Life was a performance. Um, again, but played to the click track with, the, with uh, JR listening to the, um, John Robinson listening to the, uh, to the click. The song Higher Love, I think we tried a version where JR, John Robinson played a performance. Um, the producer Russ Tidelman wasn't feeling it, so we we proceeded to do overdubs. Um, so I think the first thing that we did was we, we was we did the hi hat. You know, Jr. played his hi hat part, and then we did kick snare and tom tom fills. Um, and then what I ended up doing was taking Jr.'s bass drum and his snare drum, sampling it and triggering triggering that off the drum machine, and then just blending in his live drum fills. On the song Higher Love, the, the, and, and some of you may know the story, but, but I'm going to tell it again because it's a great story. So back then in 1985 when we recorded that album, it was standard operating procedure for us to stripe a reel of tape of six minutes. It was just standard. We would, would put a reel of analog tape up. We would stripe time code, six minutes, and then put a leader in, and that would be the song. So even if the song was only three and a half minutes long, pretty much you cut the track or the click track for six minutes. So at the end of Higher Love, there's about a minute after the song fades out of the track, just it continu- it continues to go. Um, and that's usually where, where uh, the musicians, for lack of a better word, are just screwing around. You know, we're just messing around. So Chris, again, always taught me, whenever you have a musician in the room, always have the machine and record. Because that's that's where the ideas come from. So I did that. So John, when John was doing his kick snare Tom Tom cymbal track, again I just left it in record, and you know you'd, you'd go back and clean it up later or whatever. So as the track began to fall apart, you know at the end, you know everybody's noodling around, and but the obviously the tempo was still there. John switches, takes the snares off his, his snare drum, and starts to play this rhythm, you know, with him sticking the toms and and hitting the snare drum like a timbali. 
we didn't think much of it at the time. You know, it was just kind of fun. And, because by this point, everybody in the track is noodling around. Fast forward as we're be- beginning to finish up the project after Shaka came in and sang her part. Um, and we're getting near to the mixing point, And Russ Teitelman turns to me and Steve and says, he says, Higher Love is a real gem. He says, but what we're missing is an introduction. And a, a light went off, you know, or it, that struck something that, that, that inspired me. And I go, I have an idea. So I took John's part. It was on the slave. I offset it, you know. And again, in the manner that Chris taught me, just stop the tape where you want the two to line up, yep. hit the button on the synchronizer. Yep. You have to tweak it a little bit. And I go... I go, Russ, what if we did something like this? And it was the, literally the intro that you hear on Higher Love was played at the end of the song. And we all turned to each other and said, oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. It was one of those intros that nobody can find the one, and, and, and that's, what, that's what was really right, cool exactly. about it. But it was a happy accident. But, yeah, I had no idea how to record drums. I had no how, idea how to do all of that. But, again, through the, through the tutorage of my brother Chris, he said, don't ever let them know that. You know, exactly. and I've, I learned it along the way, and I was shocked. I felt like I still think that the Grammys want their Grammy back. <laughs> 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 you know, after they hear these stories, I might get a letter. Uh, you're going to have to send that best engineered recording Grammy back. <laughs> well, I mean that story, especially the happy accident. Look, just moving apart from the end of the song to the front was a bit more of a chore. Where now it's it's instantaneous but finding something that makes magic i think is important that's a great story and, and it's good every time and knowing that it's there too <laughs> thanks tom yeah. let's talk about let's just go back a couple of years before that eddie kramer you've tracked situations where the limitations are a lot higher there's less of a track count it's either four or eight tracks and you might be dealing with an artist that's let's say a little eccentric so walk me through a tracking that you had to do with Jimi Hendrix where you were deciding how to set up his band and how you would get it accomplished? Um, <clears throat> Jimi Hendrix uh, at Olympic Studios or later? How about just pick a day where you like, this is when you kind of had control on making it happen and putting it together for him. It, it was uh, either Olympic or, well, we'll do an early one. Okay. So Mitch Mitchell won the world's most fabulous drummers, I think we would all agree. His technique um, is based upon his love of jazz. You know, he was, Elvin Jones, of course, was his mentor in that sense, and he has this lovely way of playing a fill that we're all going, uh, is he ever going to find the one? <laughs> and Jimmy's look at he, looking at him, and he's does, doing this most ridiculous, I better get a and it's on the one. It's fabulous. So he's in the room at Olympic, little booth over him like this, and Jimmy's got his amp next to him, a couple of booths, little side screens, and Noel on one side. Basically, you know, set up like a trio. Um, not many room mics. The only room mic was Jimmy's vocal mic. Really? That was it? That was it. It was a Bayer M160 because he quite often would sing live in the room and that was the only thing I could find that would actually give us enough separation and quite a few of the vocals are from that mic. Wow. Um, That's just to give you an example of what happened at Olympic. There was... Chaz Chandler was a producer and Chaz used to be the bass player as, as we all know from The Animals and he said... Jimmy, look, we're starting now, 7 o'clock. We've got to finish by 10. We only have three hours. <laughs> a limitation, yeah. imagine that. Three hours, that's it. You know, And we managed to cut two tracks in that time frame. So just give me a song title of the couple of tracks you would have cut in those three hours, just so we have a um, Purple Haze. <laughs> Purple Haze, yeah. You, know, I mean, you may have heard track. that one. At least the basic track. <laughs> right. Okay, let's take Purple Haze, for example. You know, it's, if you look at the four tracks, you've got... Well, in fact, on, on Are You Experienced, which was a more primitive album than the subsequent ones, there were, it was a mono drum track, uh, guitar, bass, and then he would overdub either a rhythm guitar. We would take those four, mix that in stereo to the secondary four-track machine, um, be a stereo mix, and then I'd have two more tracks. And that would be percussion and another vocal track or a solo again or something like that. 
And then if we wanted more stuff, we would take that four and mix it back to the first machine. So we would have four to four to four or just regular four to fours. And you had to make sure that that damn mix was... What they wanted. It, because you have to think ahead. There's, there's right. no synchronizing it. Uh, no. And sometimes, you know, not all the parts yet still. So, you know, there might not be a solo yet. So no. you have to think... Okay. You have to think ahead... <laughs> Okay, this is, if I do this here, then I'm really going to be screwed later on. So I'd have been, make sure that it's correct. You know. Did you ever do an overdub during the bounce of the four tracks of the stereo? Yes. Add in a li- like a yes. live bounce to like take advantage of not losing a generation again. Exactly. There, there will be a time I, I can remember when Jimmy had to do a solo where we only had one place to put it, and that was in the middle of where the vocal stops. Right. And you can actually hear it on the, our four tracks, which I managed over the years to sync up. And I now have multiple tracks of them all, all in sync. So I can actually hear that. And it's so scary to hear, here comes a vocal, and all of a sudden, <laughs> there's a solo. <laughs> Holy shit, now what am I going to do? <laughs> so because of the limitations, did you, you were actually able to find the original pre- the, the original four-track basic before you did the bounce down, and then now with Pro Tools you can line it up and actually undo the, the comping yes. somewhat. Somewhat. I mean, some of the stuff is glued together, but right. for all intents and purposes, yes, I can have separate drums, separate bass, which now, if I may just jump ahead, can I tell you all about one session which is different than that, and that would be at the record plant in 1968. There's a, there's a wonderful story about, well, here we are in New York City, record plant, brand new studio. I'm in there mixing away and, well, let me back up a second. How many tracks? Uh, this would be 12 track. Wow, 12 tracks. This is the 12 track one inch Scully, which was the yeah. biggest piece of shit you ever heard. <laughs> but it was still 12 yeah. tracks. Good luck well, it rewinding was, it. It. Was, it was noisy. That was the yeah. problem. But... Imagine we're on 44th Street and 8th Avenue. That's where the record plant was. But on 46th Street and 8th was this famous club called The Scene, which is where Jimmy used to jam. So on any night, we, the session's booked for 7, 7.30, and no Jimmy. Where's Jimmy? Oh, he's over at The Scene. So we're... Everything's set up. We spend four hours testing everything, the amps, making sure the drums are set up and everything's cool. At midnight, Jimmy comes strolling in. Now you can imagine Jimmy's walking down 8th Avenue with the hat, the guitar, and trailing 15 stoned-out people, stopping traffic. It's quite a scene. Walks into the record plant. They plug in, and we record a song called Voodoo Child. Two takes, really? one, one, one run through, one take, live on the floor, and it's done. Um, by the way, Steve Winwood played organ, uh-huh. and uh-huh. Uh, Jack Cassidy played bass. But oh. this is this wonderful sort of collection of musicians that he would find at the scene and say, you guys come with me. Now, is there a crowd? Pre-production at the scene. Pre-production right? at the scene. <laughs> come and record at the record floor. So is there a crowd of people in the room? I mean... There were about 10, 12 people in the control room, at least, all smoking and doing whatever. Was there people in the live room, too, like... No, talk, no, no, not in the live room, no. So the recording, right, because it sounded like a party on mm-hmm. that song. But Steve just happened to be along for the ride. No, it's, it's not only was he along for the ride, but Jimmy loved him so much, he said to Steve Winwood can you join my band? Mm. Wow. Can you imagine? Wow. Yeah. Amazing. Good Lord. I never heard that, Tom. You ever hear that? From I, yeah. I, well, I did not know that. Oh. But no, that's awesome. <laughs> wow, that's an amazing story. So look at this. We, an artist that just is inspired, perfect for that line, comes right off stage, comes right in the control room, and it's in one take or two takes. And that with the 160 with the live vocal, but now 12 track. 12 track, yeah. So that's Electric Lady record, right? No, no that, that's the Electric Lady album, album, but right. not Electric Lady Studios. It's right, Electric, right. Electric Ladyland album. Right, Let Ladyland. Right. So, was a, that a lot of that record twelve track then? And you have those the, tapes still? We do. 
and I've just remixed Electric Ladyland in 5.1 surround sound. Wow. Which is really cool. I'm sure there's some shit spinning around your head in the background there. It's beautiful. Yeah, I bet it is. You have a joystick, and I can take Jimmy's guitar and spin it around the room, and it's really stoned out. (laughs) (laughs) Is that something he'd be interested in? Oh, he would have been totally down with it. He was so into the whole thing. (laughs) We mixed together. Right. I mean, we split up the console. It was, you know, maybe... 24, tr- tr- uh, 24 inputs. It was a, a data mix console. It was an awful thing. But um, Jimmy would sit next to me. Hi, Jimmy. How you doing? <laughs> and we'd just say, okay, Jimmy, do vocals and guitar and stuff, and I'll do this part over here. And then I'd have a, a Variac, which was um, a, a device, you know, for adjusting the voltage going to uh, an am- with an oscillator and an amplifier, which would drive the capstan on one of the machines so we could... Rec- put the machine at seven and a half and slow it all the way down to three and three quarters and below and then have feedback loops. And so all the sounds you're hearing in the mix is live as we're doing it. Yeah, there's no going back on that. No, it's just... So you can't really make stems from that? Uh, no. <laughs> and, and, and everybody was sober while this was going on, right? Exactly. Oh, there was yeah. a lot of Starbucks. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so these creations, right, were one-time deals. That means what you printed... There's no, okay, let's do it again for the vocal up. Let's make an instrumental. There is none of that nonsense going Just on. Just do it again. There was no doing it again. Or you could do it again. But it's going to be different. That's going to be different. Right. Wow, an amazing story. Two stories about, about working on four track and bouncing for some unknown song called Purple Haze. And then moving into Voodoo Child, which we're all familiar. And I didn't even know that he wanted to have um, Steve Winwood jump in that band. That's pretty amazing. Me. Me and Tommy, you know, Tommy obviously knows him more than I do, and we still see him. And uh, I'm going to have to ask him that story again. Wow, that's wild. So Eddie Kramer is giving us a story here. Let's move on to his partner. Who, 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 he called him Jimmy now. <laughs> so Dave Way, walk me through a day. Uh, let's just move forward a few years. Let's walk me through a day of when you're producing and how you track, or as an engineer, where you work with the artist, what your setup would be, and you're actually actually able to accomplish, say, a song that we'd be familiar with. Well, these days, I, I'm, uh, I'm pretty much set up to record at, at my studio any time. So walk where in, is this now? This is at Way Station. In the, oh, the Way Station. Of course it is. Yeah, yeah. You have enough hit spray there? Everyone familiar with Dave Way's uh, hit spray? There is. Yeah, it's all, is that for sale spray. here? Or? <laughs> Do you have any available for us? You know, the, 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 the uh, TSA guys always take it from me when I'm, when I'm coming in. They, know, they use it for their records, so they oh, just God. snag it from me as soon as I go through the airport. Uh, but, but the studio is all set up for, you know, all the drums are mic'd up and there's a bass booth and a guitar booth and another one that has the Leslie for the organ and the piano's mic'd up and, uh, headphones are all, everything's bust out. So you can basically walk in any time of day and if you've got something to record, we'll be, we'll be ready to go. And then it's, uh, you know, it's a matter of. Uh, I, I loved what Danny said about uh, getting with uh, with uh, uh, Henley, and the first order of business was what What do you have to say? What's the you know that that's that very important to me because uh, it, it speaks volumes as to intent and you know why why we're making music to begin with you know so we got something to say. So do you have a story of an art when you tracked an artist of a, a song that came together like that where you were were there and it, it happened quickly in front of you? Uh, well, geez, uh, let me think, but, uh, I mean, I, 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 for me in general, the, the, the quicker it happens, the better, you know, it's like, like <laughs> what, 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 you know, Eddie said, if you're ready, you got the place all ready to go. And then artist walks in and they don't have to think about it. They're inspired. They're, they're, they're in the mood. The, the, the you know, the, the players are, are, are ready to go. The less thinking there is, the better. So, you know, if, if you're the, the preparation and being ready for that moment to happen, happen and then just, you know, capture it. And, and we're lucky now. We don't have to deal with tape machines, really. If we're going, you know, Pro Tools, it's, you know, you can let that go all day long. It can be recording from before anybody walks in, you know. So it's like if, if, if you're ready to go, just have it, have it you know, you can... Mess with the sound later if you need to. You know, we're we're lucky now that we can you know have a whole. You know, I don't even know how many inputs I have going live at any moment. But it's don't you, know, you think plenty. sometimes by having that luxury of infinite channels and infinite tracks, 
actually creates worse problems Absolutely. with the artists we work with. Yeah. You know, when Eddie would say, when we only had four or eight or 12 or, you know, our era is where it was always a 24 or 22. Kind of perfect, isn't it? It yeah. gave you a boundary. It gave you a place. Okay, this is your parking space. This is your parking space. You just can't unpack your bag and throw it all over the room and have all those tracks. Ah. Yeah. And I think a, a lot of times the biggest problem we run into is spreading it far and wide until we really don't even, don't even have a song. And, and an arrangement also, you know, when you can, uh, if the musicians are good, they're going to, they're going to self-arrange uh, at, at any moment. And, and as long as they can hear themselves well, they're going to be able, you know, you, first of all, number one rule to making a good record is get great musicians. If you, if you, when, once you figure that part out, the rest of it's, you know, you got 80% of your job is done. Let's talk about great musicians. Danny, you have a couple of... Your band is you and three no-names. I think it's uh, Lee Scalar, Russ Kunkel, and Wadi Wattel. Guys that are relatively new to the game. Um, how, do you, how, do, how does it work when you have to show them how to make records like you do? Um, do you have a little bit of a learning curve? or uh, You walk in and you guys are ready to go, huh? Well, uh, yeah, just, you know, just as Dave said, these guys are great, great musicians. And all of our job was to come up with something for the song right now. And that's what we did. That's how we, we got to uh, be able to do a lot of sessions. And be immediate yeah. as the family? Exactly. Ah. Uh -huh. And that's the thing. To be, you need to be able to come up with something right away that's going to help the song. And that goes for everyone, all the musicians. And you've got to stop. You've got to put your ego aside. It ain't about you. It's about how you can help. And I was taught by Peter Asher and Lou Adler as a session musician. And Peter always said to me, think like a producer. And uh, so that meant get a part that's going to help that, you know, they can turn up because it's not too busy. It's not getting in the way of the song. Oh. And uh, this is just obvious stuff, but it didn't occur to me until Peter mentioned that to me. And then uh, that really changed the way I was approaching. So, so oh, that is good, Danny. I love that one. So, so Eddie, did you have the same, same immediacy with this other new band you're working with called, uh, what were they called? Keith Moon called them, what? Led Zeppelin, those guys. Le um, yeah, Led, Led something or other, yeah. I mean, talking about, parts that don't get in the way. I mean, we were very fortunate with Zeppelin. You have two guys in the band who are absolutely incredible musicians, Jimmy Page and John Paul Jones, both of whom were session musicians way before they became rock stars. And I remember being at Olympic in 67 and watching John Paul Jones walk in, studio about this size, big screen at one end for movie, you know, we would do mu music to picture and all that kind of stuff, and he would walk in, 60-piece orchestra, have the bass he's over his arm and wheel a little B-15 amp in and big pile of charts under the arm, come up to the conductor's rostrum, put the charts down, bass amp right next to the rostrum. We'd put a couple of screens around that, plug in his bass, and he would conduct the entire 60-piece orchestra with the bass in his hand like mm -hmm. this. It was fantastic. So we became good friends, and when Zeppelin finally came together... Quick story about that. Um, I used to go over to his house and we used to partake in the green weed, which was lovely. But I, I stopped that many years later. Um, but it was wonderful. And he, he said to me one day, this is just before I came to America in 68, he said, Eddie, come over to the house. I've got to play you something. And he put on this acetate and it was the first Zeppelin album. And I listened to it and I went, holy shit, what is it? This is amazing. It's, it's so heavy. What, what is this, my new band? It's called Led Zeppelin. And I said, that's the stupidest damn name I ever heard in my life. <laughs> was I ever wrong? <laughs> but that's just one example of how a, a creative guy like that joins the band. Jimmy Page, I rem the first session I ever remember Pagey being on was 1964. I was at Pie Studios, and he played on a Kinks record that I was assistant engineer on. So Wow. Know. So you're saying he walked in with an acetate before anybody else yeah. really besides the band yeah. and say, hey, Eddie, check this shit out. It's my new band, like playing you some demos. <laughs> yeah. and, you, and you heard like the opening cut, and you're like, this is really heavy. But you know what? That name sucks. <laughs> <laughs> no, Keith gave him that name, right? That's what I heard, right? Yeah, yeah. Wow. he did. But it, to talk about Zeppelin in the studio, Page had laser vision. He knew precisely from the time that the song was created. 
he could see and hear and feel all the way down to the final, final product. And that's, mm. that's, that's really a gift. And being in the room with them, actually recording, you get that sense, I better get my shit together and think ahead. Where's he going with this? What sounds is he looking for? Can I improve them? Can I change them? Can I assist in that? And that's the So you jumped on board right after the first one? Yeah, I, they were in New York um, promoting their first album, and I got the call and said, hey, can you come in and help us? We, you know, we need some more tracks for this new album, and we record a whole bunch here in New York at Juggy Sound, 8-track. Uh, and then more overdubs over at A&R Studios, and then we mixed the whole album in two days over a weekend at A&R. So the tracks you cut were... Oh, um, Whole Lot of Love and all that. So, well, actually, Whole Lot of Love was cut by, in England by um, Andy Johns, I believe. But we did all the overdubs in, in, in New York. But you mixed, mixed that one. But I mixed the whole album in so, two days. So I've, I've talked to Eddie, Teddy about this, and I'm, I'm not sure if your memory might be a little bit foggy. You know the multitrack is out there, the Whole Lot of Love I'm multitrack. Sure. So I hate to say I have a copy of the Whole Lot of Love multitrack, but okay. the genius... Wow of when you're sitting at the console and making the decision is in that song is there's a part in that song where it comes down and it's the way down inside. Way down. And, and you what you hear is a ghost vocal. Yeah. And I've always thought there was some weird kind of pre-delay or print through uh-uh. until I heard the multitrack and what it is. And any modern engineer would have muted it. Exactly. It's the slide guitar overdub that was done in probably in the control room. No. Or wh- however it was no, done, it but the vocal that was being played yeah, at the time yeah. the slide guitar was recorded was a different vocal. So th- there's another part of the story. So if you imagine you've got your eight track, right? S- track seven and eight are the two vocal tracks. Uh, seven was an earlier take. Eight was the actual master. And here's this console at, a- at A&R. It's rotary knobs. Mm. And there's only 12 channels and two pan parts and very primitive EQ. Um, so Jimmy said, hi, Jimmy. Hi. Another, hey. Good to be back. <laughs> yeah. Hey. It's Jimmy again. A pair of Jimmy's. <laughs> um, so Paige is the next bit, and, and we've we got the mix going. We've got all the reverbs and stuff going. And here comes this bloody vocal. And I turned seven all the way down. And because the pot wouldn't turn all the way off, I couldn't get it to go away. And mm-hmm. as that's happening... He's looking at me, and I'm looking at him, and we both start laughing our asses off, and we both reach for the reverb sand knob at exactly the same moment and crank the reverb on, and we left it in. It's brilliant. What's the deal? Leave the goddamn mistakes in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. No, but it's, I mean, that right there, it was a piece of inspiration that's inspired me when I listened to that song because I've been trying to figure that out my whole life, how that happens. Yeah. You know what I mean? And it inspires me to this day when I'm mixing. How can, you know, when you're listening to a song, what's going through your head, how do I get that to come out of the speakers? And that pops in my head quite often. Oh, dear. So that, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> exactly. So, you know, imagine, you know, imagine in a song, I always found that in that spot of the song, when you're at a party with people listening and it's in the background, it hits the break, it gets quiet. Everyone's like, hey, check this shit out. What's that? What's that? No, what's that sound? It became a moment that when you guys laughed about it, we were all like thinking about what was that, who did that. So when you know making these creations, what are we coming across, right? We're coming across like accidents and magic that don't involve Pro Tools, that don't involve plugins, don't involve tuning, and don't involve like editing, right? They just involve just manual usage of manipulating music. Don't right? involve taking them out, leave them in. Yeah, that's taking a leap forward. Now, now, Tommy, when you've, when you've done a tracking session with a band, let's just throw in a situation where you had some live players in there and saw some magic unfold right in front of you. I know that, you know, as an engineer over the years, I, I was able to see a few of those moments. Um, walk me through one of those moments on a song where it came together so fast before you knew it. Yeah. I'm going to go back to Higher Love because the, the Shaka Khan story has always been, been one of my favorites. So, again, the one great thing about doing the Back in the High Life album, it was so early in my career, I learned so much about it. I had no freaking idea what I was doing. Um, and, again, I, I took Chris's advice and just told him all, sure, I can do this. 
you know. Um, but it was the Shaka Khan story. So, you know, Russ Teitelman, who produced the album, um, had an awesome phone book and was friends with everybody. So he had, had all these great musicians coming in. And, and again, I'm just in awe of all these cats, so I'm try, trying to keep it cool because I'm controlling the session, I'm running the session, I'm trying to keep the vibe light and make it, you know, um, conducive to, to creativity. So, you know, we're shocked. To, to, um, Russ says shock is going to come in today. So we set up the, the, I think we're using a 67 or an 87 for her vocal, and she's in, you know, I set her up in the, in the, in the, in the room at Unique Recording, you know, and I got, you know, little stand there. I know she was a smoker, so we put an ashtray there, and we have some tea for her. You know, so Shaka comes in, and we have our, our pleasantries, blah, 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 and, you know, she goes out. I'll listen to it in the cans. So as, as, as per Chris, you know, she's out there, hit record. First chorus goes by. You know, she's smoking a cigarette. No, you know, and we're, you know, Steve and I look at each other. Second chorus goes by. She's still smoking a cigarette. You know, and now Russ and I, we're all looking at each other. Third chorus comes in. Then all of a sudden, we see her take a puff off the cigarette. And as she's exhaling, she comes up with these ad libs, you know, which ended up making the record, but smoking me out of her mouth. Steve and I are just falling on the floor laughing. I mean, we're trying to keep it together, but we're laughing our ass off because it's so amazing. And all this smoke is coming out of her mouth. And of course, if I didn't have it in record, I wouldn't have got that. Again, thank you to my brother Chris for always in record. I had a really quick go over and just bring the gain down on the compressor because it was just slightly peaking. You know, I mean, it was, well, okay, it was hammering the tape. It was tape, hammering. You know, and I think it ended up, you know, bleeding into the next two channels over. And I was never able to get rid of that. Um, but yeah, but we were just, it was, you know, a, a very magic moment, but yeah, with the smoke coming out of her mouth. And, and again, these just amazing ad libs. And that's how you capture the magic in the way we went. And, and again, it's like, these are professional musicians. These are musicians and any musicians out there. And for the cats, you know, engineers, producers that are in the room, remember that musicians, this is their job. So don't try to take a mediocre performance and, and edit it, tune it, or anything like that. These are musicians. This is what they do. Just ask them to play it again. Because you, and, and because now you don't have to erase the old one, but this is what musicians do. Don't make mediocrity, mediocrity your record. You know, let the musicians be musicians. Capture the magic. You know, and that's, I think, what is, is what we're all trying to say here. Just like all these classic records, you know, I'm, I don't know why I'm even up here, but all these classic records that these cats have made, you know, we, we just encourage or, or we allow, you know, we let the musicians... Be musicians. Right, and capture the vibe. I mean, you set yeah. it up so that there is a vibe in the studio. Um, fortunately, I was in Electric Lady yesterday with my wife and a friend of ours, and we walked into Studio A, and the vibe was, oh. And my friend, who's a musician, was with me today, and he said, I can walk in here, and I can make a record immediately. And it depends on the room and how you set it up and what it is, the lights, the... Yeah. The, the aura that's in that room and you want to be inspired and if you've got all your shit together in terms of being an engineer you've got a, a nice drum sound you've tuned the drums or whatever you've helped the drummer to tune the drums maybe uh, you've gotten a great sound with a, with a martial amp or maybe that's too big maybe you want to fend you, you go through all of these things where you, you want to serve the artist and serve the song I'm not sure which one would come first but it would be the artist first and then the song. But you, the thing that I walk into the studio and, and hear, having heard a song before with the artist, going into the studio, I think, how can I best serve that message? How can I bring the best out of the artist? And how can I take it up to a higher level? Whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there you go. A higher level. There you go. So, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, you know, we're all speaking the same language here and talking about what, you know, what's important in making music. So, Dave, give me a moment when a, you had a gunslinger or you had a studio musician come in to do parts for a band or for an artist, and you were just amazed by how quick and how instantly they would turn something into magic. Mm -hmm. uh, well, okay, you know what? I'm th immediately I think of this, one of the first sessions I did in L.A., I came out to work with Michael Jackson, 
And uh, we who? had had all these. Michael who now? Michael Jackson? Who's he? Anyway. <laughs> he was a kid. But a little, little grew kid. Up. Right? Yeah. But uh, we had, I, I, I was in New York, living in New York, and, and I was working with this producer, Teddy Riley, and we had come up with all these kind of tracks to play for Michael when we went out there, not sure how it would go. And when we got out there, he uh, listened to like 14 tracks that we just had on a dat. And uh, he was like, oh, I love that one, and I love that. So, you know, we got the gig, and we were, we were staying, and then w within a couple of days, he had an idea for a chorus part for one of the songs. It ended up being the song Remember the Time, which was uh, one of the singles on that album. But so he just had the idea for the, for the melody and the lyric for the chorus, and he said, I just want to put that down. And this, so this is my first time recording Michael. And back then, this is the early 90s, um, particularly if we were working on choruses, we would stack, you know, this is very R&B uh, land at the time. You'd, you'd do one chorus and you'd do, say, you know, six, 12 stacks, and, uh, and then you would fly them in by taking the two tape machines and the synchronizer and move it over so that every chorus was exactly the same. And uh, so Michael said, okay, I, you know, I'm ready. And, and uh, so I said... <laughs> Well, <laughs> now I'm Michael Jackson. I was, I was Jimi Hendrix, Jimmy Page. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so we, I said, okay, I'll just go to the first chorus. And uh, he said, oh, no, just go from the beginning. I thought, okay, he just wants to warm up a little bit. Cool. So I go to the top of the song, and uh, we get through the first chorus, and he does the first pass of the first note. And uh, it, I stopped it, and, he, and, and you know, thinking we're just going to – we just need the first chorus. And he said, why did you stop? What? I was like, uh, oh, well, we just need the one chorus. He goes, oh, no, no, just keep going. So I uh, picked it up from there and then uh, went back to, you know, he's, we'll go back to the top again. And so I realized, okay, he just wants to sing it through every time. So uh, <laughs> we did. We went back and doubled that first take. And it was, like, perfectly synchronized, the breaths were all right on, and the pitch was perfect, and I was like, okay, and then we did the second note, and we did the double track of that, and we probably did, you know, three parts, maybe, uh, you know, a double track or triple track, each one, and we went to the first chorus, and then we got to the second chorus, and the third chorus was a little bit more intense, it was pretty much the same, but, and we were done with the whole song in about... 15, 20 minutes, and, I, and, I, and it was like so great and so perfect, and each one was just a little bit different, and it kind of had this natural arc, and it, you know, I was still a kid kind of at the time, and I just thought to myself, man, this is like, why don't we do this all the time, you know, why, why do we spend, because if I had flown on all these choruses, it would have taken me, yeah, you know, it's like you got to figure out the math and the sync points, and it's a pain in the ass, and, you know, I was, I was like, well, why don't, we do this all the time, and then I kind of realized that, well, we're not always recording Michael Jackson because, you know, <laughs> it's now, like... Did you do any lead vocals on that? Well, this or? was, you know, he just had the chorus idea, so it was just like a stacked, you know, uh, three-part harmony. Are you singing anything in between? The no, he, I, I think he had an idea of the melody and some of the other memories I had from that, too, would like, he would, j when it was, when he had ideas, he would just say, give me a mic, and we'd just give him a 57 sitting right next to me at the, at the console, and he'd just, you know, hum some fake lyrics or just melody ideas, and, it w and he would take that home, and he would, you know, run it sometimes for months, because he would not record the lead vocal until he was absolutely ready to give a performance. He, he, was, he wanted to, there was no reading the lyrics, there was, you know, he, he had to know the song, know the kind of feeling that he wanted to project in, while he was doing the vocal and just be in the right headspace. So he would not record a vocal until all ready. that, yeah, until he was absolutely ready to just wow. like kill it. And then he would. And it would, it would some, sometimes he would do more than, you know, quite a few takes and we would do some comps. But um, for the most part, you know, you could pick any one of them. and That's a sign of a pro. It's a sign of a pro. Yeah. 
Yeah. I know Tina was the same way. She'd rehearse it, come in, knock it down with yeah. the band live. Yeah. And we'd say, hey, you want to go again? He goes, why? Well, they want to see it again. <laughs> now, with Jimmy, was it Jimmy or Robert Plant, two no-namers? Um, was, uh, was it similar in the vocal recording? Was it a little more off the cuff? Was it practice when you guys did vocals, or it just came naturally from Jimi Hendrix? Jimi Hendrix hated the sound of his voice, oh. so much so that I had to build him a three-sided screen like this, boom, boom, like that, facing away from the control room so nobody could see him. Singing. Singing. He was so shy, and he thought his voice sucked. That they, I thought it was the world's greatest song stylist of that genre. And then he would, we'd, you know, turn the lights down, you know, the usual thing, you know, the little stool, when he's standing there and he's singing. And then we'd get through the first... With just one take straight through, and he'd poke his head around the side and say, Hey man, how was that? It was great, Jimmy, it was great. No, I gotta do it again. I gotta do it. And he would do like two or three. We'd have to punch him in maybe a couple of times. Three takes, boom, done. Thank you. And uh, Danny, vocals with Don, were they well rehearsed and thought out, and you would definitely put the time in? Well, Don did all his work in the studio for, for vocals. Oh. Did, uh, and in other words, he would come in, he hadn't. A lot of times he wasn't sure what he was going to sing, so he'd go over and over and over, and again we'd record them all. So it's a bit more experimentation in the actual control in That's the right. studio. That's right. See what yeah. sounded he, right. He didn't really sing until he got in the studio and put the earphones on. And heard what it sounded like in the track. Right. Yeah, that's right. How about with Steve, Tommy? Steve. Steve Winwood. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. Steve sang into an RE20. It was very strange. <laughs> wow. I tried all these different microphones. I, I mean, Steve was great because... When he went to do his vocals, he just, he never said anything to me. So I first I set up a, a, an 87, and he sang in it. And then I set up a 414, and he sang it, and he didn't like it. And he goes, here, let me sing in my mic. I mean, what do you mean your mic? He goes, uh, this is what I use for my vocal. And it's an RE20. Mm-hmm. And we did all the vocals on an RE20. And Steve was, a, to be quite honest, two passes. Yeah. I, I, mean, I mean, he was like a two, he would sing the song twice pick one of them and maybe we just punch in one word yeah. you know I mean it's and there was we spent we never spent any time in the vocals I mean like in other words he, in my opinion he was that good mm. wow it, it, it was the strangest thing and the RE20 was just, the, we, was even weirder but it, it the RE20 yeah. as soon as we did that it reminded me of Dear Mr. Fantasy it reminded me of Valerie it reminded me you know I, I can't say give me some loving because I have no idea that they even had that microphone back then but um, did not. but it had that sound, you know. I mean, all of a sudden, as soon as he sang in that mic, it it was that memory of uh, that I had in my head of of what wow. Steve sounded it was like. Dynamic mic, mic too. So you know, because he you know, he's got some power. So when, when he the, would... the other thing with Steve is no vibrato. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that he's straight on, yeah. knob on, and he's always knob on pitch. <laughs> I was always you know, but never any you know, yeah. no shaky shaky. No wakey wakey, no shaky looked, shaky. One of the greatest <laughs> great, great stories here about singers, performers, artists, recording. The common thread here is about you you get what you give, okay? And the artists we work with give a lot, and the kind of music we like to record is given in that way. You know, it's a little bit uninspiring when you work in a world now where there's a lot of cheating and a lot of cutting and pasting. It kind of takes the actual soul out of it. So, you know, as we come here and wrap up, I want to ask, ask if we have any questions. We have about five minutes left. These are great stories from Tom, Eddie, Dave, and Danny. So I really appreciate you guys coming down and just sharing a little insight to an amazing world of record making on some songs that maybe you or the rest of the billion people on the planet know very well. So uh, thank you guys all for coming. If we have any questions, we have a few more minutes left. Go to the microphone here. Anybody have a question for the four gentlemen up here? Here we go. We have our... You had touched upon how uh, Michael Jackson, um, his process, he would just kind of hum. Um, was that typical for artists you guys have worked with over the years where people would just get loose ideas through just imp- like humming or beatboxing? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's different for everybody because, uh, you know, Michael was not a songwriter like who, you know, like Steve Winwood or, you know, Jimmy Page or somebody where he would just sit at the piano and write a song and have the song kind of written by the time you got to the studio. The way we were working was a kind of typical R&B, uh, you know, pop model at the time where you, you 
you built a track not knowing what the song really, or at least not in, intentionally not going there yet because you knew that Michael was going to get involved in that part of the process. I mean, if we'd walked in with like a finished song and, you know, a, a demo vocal from somebody else, it probably wouldn't have got the gig because, you know, uh, he wants to be... He has know, no input. He yeah, he has no input. So, so there was that room for him to, to do his thing. And, um, you know, and he's a writer mainly for melody and, and lyrics, you know. He, I, I, I don't know. I, I've seen him play piano, but I don't know if he's, you know, he's not Greg Fillinganes or somebody on piano, you know. Um, so he was writing the song as he was, as he was listening to the track over and over and over. And he would listen over, he would just sometimes just sit in the control room listening to the dat or the multi-track, you know, just getting in the zone, getting ideas down. And he would do the same at his house. And, you know, uh, and like I said, he would not record a real vocal until he was absolutely, you know, ready to deliver it. And it was going to be the vocal um, but before that, he was just getting ideas, and it was, you know, just give me a track. He's going to hum some things. Maybe he would do it twice, probably not. Just getting melody ideas, really. And he was, the other part of the process that I found interesting was that he was always, when you would hear how it would evolve, it would always get simpler. He was always, like, taking things out or simplifying a melody. And sometimes I wished that he had kept kind of the earlier version, because, like, you know, I always loved... The Michael Jackson of when he was 12 years old and he was trying to sound like James Brown, basically, you know. So, you know, and he would do a lot more singing, you know. But, uh, but he was always simplifying. And, and he mentioned that that was one of the things that Quincy taught him. So, you know, I think that was, that was definitely a part of his process in, in his editing of his performances. Thank you, Dave. That was a good insight to Michael Jackson. One more question before we wrap up. Uh, two more questions at the most here. How do you uh, put creative limitations on yourselves as mix engineers and producers to prevent you from going through every plug-in and possible piece of outboard gear? Ban the plug-ins. <laughs> I, I, I don't put any creative, creative limitations on myself. None. None. I use them with analog. I mean, yeah, like, like Tommy was saying, you just you, you, you can't put a limitation. When I, you get in the studio, you've got to keep your mind open, do anything you can to, like I said, to improve, help, make the thing sound better. That's and you have to trust your instincts as to what's right and, you know, just... Know when not great over, is great. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Not, know not when great is great. It. Yeah. And know when to stop. Right. Yeah. One more? Yeah, one more question before you wrap up. That's a good one. Yeah. Speaking of limitations, I wanted to ask Eddie, when you got to 12 tracks with Hendrix... How did that change how you tracked the drums? And I was also wondering, did you still bounce tracks or did you just use 12 tracks? Very quickly, drums were then, um, bass drum, snare, and a mono track of all the rest of it. Three, three tracks maybe, or, or it would just be a stereo drum track. Very quickly, jumping to Jimmy, when Jimmy knew that there was an eight, uh, uh, no longer eight track, but now 12, Hey, man, more tracks from my guitar. But, Jimmy, I'm going to have... I'm going to mix all the... You know, and that's when we started to do the combinations, a quick sort of... Jimmy, do a guitar solo. Or do another solo. Do another solo. Bam. Okay, we got four. Let's do a quick... Re you know, take the best of all of those. He'd grab a couple. I would grab a couple. Okay, here, 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 here. Bam. There's our next final track. But it was really fast. That's so much fun. <laughs> I mean, these stories could go on forever, and we wish we had more time, but we're here at the finish line. This is Chris Lord Algy for Inspire here at AES. Danny Korchmeyer, Dave Way, Eddie Kramer, Tom Lord Algy. Give him a big hand. <laughs>